I will begin to speak to you now about what I believe is part of the message of God concerning the 70th anniversary of the State of Israel. You'll, I might take you on a trip that is, you'll have to follow me, okay? Um, because we're gonna, we're gonna touch various points. Some of them perhaps you've not even thought about before. Perhaps you have, I don't know. But we need the Holy Spirit to really help us to understand uh, where we are in the history of Israel and the history of the church. Now, what I am sharing with you, I am not saying, thus saith the Lord. I am saying, I believe there are elements of this message which are from the Holy Spirit that the Lord wants us to understand. And because of the relationship that God is establishing between Israel and Africa, which is very significant in the plan of God, and as we go more and more into the end times, we will understand how significant this relationship between Israel and Africa is in terms of the things that God wants to fulfill. Uh, in the completion of the mystery of God. Now, we are dealing with mysteries. Paul talks about mysteries. Mysteries are realities of God in the spirit realm that he wants to bring forth in incarnational form uh, in his people. But a mystery is something that the Holy Spirit has to open up to us. With the mystery of Israel, there's the, the mystery of incarnation. There's the great mystery of the bride of Messiah that Paul speaks about. And all of these things are interconnected in a very, very deep and special way because God is one. And everything that we understand about God's plan should always go back to the essence of who God is in himself in his identity. In his identity, in Christian language, we speak of the Trinity, the three persons of the Godhead that are fully one in their relationship, in their essence, in their koinonia, in their love relationship, in their humility, in the life of the divine community, which God has sent his son into the world to manifest the heavenly reality on earth. Now, we know that Israel, or maybe you don't know, but the main prayer of the Jewish people is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's a proclamation. It's a proclamation. And we don't have the time to go into every word of that prayer, but if we would go into the words of that prayer, we would see that that prayer expresses already unity in plurality. Uh, and that that unity in plurality has to do with the very essence of the mystery of Israel, uh, which I don't know if I will be able to get into that very much today. So I would like to begin with a, a reading from Exodus 19. which has to do with the very identity and calling of the nation of Israel. And from verse 3. Now this is the time when God is making his covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, a very important moment in the history of the nation of Israel. And Moses, verse 3, And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians 
and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now what we want to take note of in these scriptures is the centrality of God. Not the centrality of Israel, but the centrality of God in this relationship. Because over and over God is referring to himself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine. Okay, so God is relating Israel to himself, but also he is pointing to the whole planet, which of course means all the different nations. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now this is the calling of the nation of Israel, and in this calling we also find the identity of Israel because it comes out of a relationship to God that God has himself given to this people. Now, you just heard this man here who was, spoke to you. He spoke to you from all of his heart. He really, he, had a, he was passionate. He was passionate. But he confessed before you that he, was, he wasn't religious. He believed more in people than he believed in God. Now, if we just read the scriptures, we see that the whole identity of Israel has to do with God and with God himself. Israel was not a people that existed. Israel is a people that God created for himself and unto himself. The fact that an Israeli can stand before you and actually confess that he doesn't believe, there is something tragic about that. There is something very sad about that, and it's part of the great reality of part of the nation of Israel today. Obviously not the whole nation, because many people in Israel today believe in God and connect the deepest uh, reality of Israel's identity with God. But if we look at these scriptures, we see that Israel exists for God. We don't exist for ourselves. We exist for God. We're not supposed to point the finger to us. We're supposed to point the finger to him. And in that relationship, we are to be a kingdom of priests unto the Lord, but for the benefit, for the benefit of the whole earth. So, the story of Israel is God's story. That's the way it begins. It's not man's story. It's God's story from the time of its creation, and God didn't create just in a natural way. It was a process of election and the supernatural. He chose Abraham. He brought forth Isaac, not Ishmael, as the son of the covenant. He loved Ishmael. He still loves Ishmael. But Isaac is the son of the covenant. And he was brought, brought forth supernaturally when both Abraham and Sarah were barren. And then we go, of course, to, from Isaac to Jacob, and it's a continuous selection of God in the mystery of election and God's own choice. And it's a story of covenantal love. Now, the identity of Israel, as I said, is in God. But if we really want to be more specific, the identity of Israel is in the person of Jesus, the King of the Jews. That is the true identity of Israel. He is God, but he is also a son of Israel. He is also the son of Abraham, the son of David, and so forth. We cannot really know God properly without really understanding his ways with Israel, not just his acts. It says in the Psalms that uh, the children of Israel knew God's acts, but Moses knew God's ways. 
And it's if we really want to know who God is, if we really want to know who Jesus is, we cannot disconnect neither God nor God the Son, Yeshua, from God's whole dealings with the nation of Israel, not only until the time of Jesus, but until today. Exactly. Until today. And we need to understand that the whole destiny, existence of Israel, but also the nations and the church are connected to this people and to the God of Israel. And there is a continuity in the plan of God. And we, if we don't see the continuity in the plan of God, then we have a schizophrenic understanding of who God is. Now this has happened over the generations in the whole history of the church, in the whole understanding of replacement theology, that God has rejected Israel, he has divorced his first wife, and he has cast away his firstborn son, and he has married another wife, who is the Christian church. Uh, this is very, very deep in the psyche of many, many Christians. Now, the danger with that is not only the fact that they're deceived and they wrongly understand God's plan because God is one, and if he's one, then there is a continuity that takes place in the word of God, but it gives us a wrong image of who God is. And the image of God is, I would say, one of the most important things. We, we cannot properly worship God if we're not worshiping him according to his true image, because that which we worship, we become. It's a mystery. If we worship him according to his true image and his true identity, that then becomes our identity and the very reality of our lives and the image unto which or into which we are being transformed. Therefore, it is most important that we allow the Holy Spirit to continuously teach us and show us who God is. Now, who, who is God? Well, we know one thing. We know that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So if we rightly know who he is, we will rightly know who the Father is. And that is, of course, one of the main reasons that he came into the world, to reveal the Father to us. Now the first, and this, goes to, this now goes to what I will be sharing with you next. We're talking about the identity of Israel, Mamlechet Kohanim Vegoi Kadosh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. God will bring Israel to that goal. We don't see it today. But he will bring Israel to that goal. Now, the first time we are confronted with the reality of the kingdom of priests is in the book of Genesis. Now, the book of Genesis has the entire genetic makeup of the Bible. If we can properly understand the book of Genesis, we will, have, we will understand the genetic makeup of the Bible and how the plan of God will unfold. You know, uh, when, when, when the sperm and the egg meet together and there's conception, the entirety of all that will be is already there. That's why, I mean, if you think of abortion, it's such a horrible thing. Because the entirety of that person is already there in that small, microscopic, uh, whatever it is, reality that people don't want to relate to. So if we can understand the book of Genesis by the help of the Holy Spirit, we will understand something much, much more of the plan of God. And the, the story of, the, of the, the priesthood and the kingdom are first brought be to our attention in the story of Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. 
which relates, of course, to Jerusalem. Now, this is the first time we actually meet Jerusalem in the scriptures. Now, if this is the first time that we meet Jerusalem, we want to pay attention to what God is saying to us. And we will not be able to go into all of what the Lord is saying here in the story of Melchizedek, but we want to look at certain points. Verse 18, chapter 14, then Melchizedek, and it's very, very brief. It's very, very brief, as often the word of God is. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. As you know, Melchizedek in Hebrew means king of righteousness. The word Salem in Hebrew, Shalem, has multiple meanings. The word Shalem in Hebrew means uh, completion, perfection, fulfillment, peace, and if you change the vowels, it means it has been paid for. And there, all these words are related. So Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now what does that make us think of? He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him, he blessed Abram, and he said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High possessor of heaven and earth. Not just heaven, but also the earth. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. So Melchizedek comes out with bread and wine as he blesses Abraham in the name of God. In Hebrew it's kone shamayim va'aretz. Kone doesn't just mean possess. Kone in Hebrew also means uh, purchased. God, it, and, it, and, it, and it makes you think of redemption because he's the one who purchased and who owns heaven and earth. And as I said, this is the first encounter that we have in scripture with Jerusalem. And in the person of Melchizedek, who is, again, a mysterious person. We don't know, was he the Lord Jesus? Was he just a picture of the Lord Jesus? In the book of Hebrews, we almost get the sense that he really was Jesus. But in any case, it shows us that the whole identity of Jerusalem from its very beginning is connected to Melchizedek and the royal priesthood that we are talking about. And this royal priesthood connects God's purposes with heaven and earth together. He is the God who is possessor of heaven and earth. Not just the heaven, but the earth. And if Melchizedek is the Lord Jesus, as he comes out after Abraham has conquered the kings that kidnapped uh, Lot. The bread and the wine already speak about God's total victory over his enemies. It's, it's the table of the Lord in the presence of his foes. And it's revealed through the covenant meal of bread and wine. And this has to do with redemption. Now, as I understand this, he is the guarantor, Melchizedek, and the priesthood that God will ultimately reveal the fact that he is possessor of heaven and earth and that his kingdom will be established in Jerusalem through Melchizedek Yeshua. Because what we see in the beginning is what will be in the end in its fullness. What we see in the beginning in genetic form is what we will see in the end in its complete form. And Melchizedek is the heir of all. He is the heir of all. He presents God as possessor of heaven and earth and he is the heir of all. Now we see that Aaron in Abraham's loins already 
brings tithe to Melchizedek. And we can say symbolically that in Melchizedek, all of Israel acknowledges King Yeshua from the beginning. This is very important for us to see. It's already a guarantee of what will be in the end. And so we are given to see already from the beginning what will be in the end as concerns Yeshua, Israel, Jerusalem, and actually the whole earth. Because it's Jerusalem is the center of God's plan for planet earth. The kingdom is a fruit of the priesthood. And we can see that God always starts with a small territory of land, which then becomes the heart which affects the whole. You can see this in the Garden of Eden, when God planted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden was really the Holy of Holies on the earth at that time. And in the Garden of Eden, the kingdom of God was already manifested, and it was God's plan that from the garden, the kingdom would spread over the whole earth. And of course, we know that there was the fall. Now, and Melchizedek comes out with bread and wine. We will see that the, the issue of the table of the Lord is something very significant in the covenantal plan of God. Israel, as a nation, has now passed through its jubilee year concerning Jerusalem, which was on the 24th of May, um, 2017. It was 50 years since her reunification in 1967. It was a very special jubilee because it was 100 years since the Balfour Declaration. It was 100 years since General Allenby entered into Jerusalem and liberated Jerusalem exactly from 400 years of Turkish rule. So it was a multiple, it was a multiple jubilee. And uh, on the 19th of April, 2018, Israel celebrated 70 years since the, her establishment as a modern state. What does this mean prophetically? That's the question. Well, let's just take it on a very basic level. Both the Jubilee year and the 70 years are always connected with the issue of the inheritance and the heir. Well, we will look into that now. We will look into Leviticus 25, where it speaks about the Jubilee year, because there was an overlap between the Jubilee of Jerusalem and the 70 years of the state of Israel. So Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25, from verse 8. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years, which is a fullness of time, seven times seven. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month on the Day of Atonement. This is the foundation for the Jubilee. There are two foundations, but they're both connected to each other. The Day of Atonement, of course, is the day of propitiation, of the sacrifice of forgiveness. You shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. So it's on the basis of the blood of that day and of the atonement that the Jubilee can take place. You shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a Jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his possession, 
You see, it's about the inheritance. And each of you shall return to his family. That which was lost because of debt will be restored on the basis of the atonement that is brought forth at that time. Now we also want to look at verse 23. The land shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. And in, the, and in all the land of your possession you shall grant redemption of the land. So the Jubilee is the re year of redemption of the land. And then verse 42. For they are my servants, Israel, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. Now what can we understand from this? We can understand from this that the reason for the Jubilee is because God himself is the owner of all things. God himself is the heir. And when God brings reconciliation, God is the one who restores. So it's based on something that is legal through the blood of atonement that God gives back to Israel what he has given to Israel, but it all belongs to God. The land belongs to God. The people belong to God. That's why the people and the land cannot be sold forever because it all goes back to God and God is faithful to his covenant that he made with Israel and he brings restoration to his people. But what we can see from this is that Israel as heir who inherits always goes back to the first heir who is God. He is the owner of all things. This is very foundational to what we are wanting to understand now. Now we're going to go to Matthew 21, and we're going to see something of the dilemma that exists in terms of what we're talking about. And this is a very painful parable, which has been greatly misunderstood by the church, even though it's very easy to come to the conclusion that the church has come to while reading this parable. Matthew 21 and verse 33. Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard. Now we know that in Isaiah chapter 5, Israel is the vineyard of the Lord. So the landowner, we know who he is, he's God. And we know the vineyard is Israel. And Jesus, who is what? He is the firstborn. He is the heir of all things. God has created all for him who is the heir. And Israel is the first part of his inheritance. It says over and over again in scripture, Israel is my inheritance. He planted a vineyard and he set a hedge around it. He dug a wine press in it and he built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when the vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants. They beat one, killed one, and stoned another. This is the painful, very painful side of the history of Israel. And it's on this note that the second book of Chronicle ends. And he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. Now, Jesus was talking here to the religious leaders of Israel. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. 
Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. Now, if we think about this, we have to really think about what the Lord is saying here. He is actually saying, well, you can say that Peter, when Peter was speaking to the leaders of Israel, he said, you did this in ignorance. But here the Lord is saying, well, it wasn't entirely in ignorance. This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. It's all firstly his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now we have to understand that officially Jesus is cast out of the vineyard until this day. In great ignorance, in great blindness, God has put a veil over our people. But we need to understand that this reality of being cast out of the vineyard exists unto this very day. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? Now again, as I said, Jesus is here speaking to the religious leaders of Israel specifically. They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their season. Okay, now we don't have to read to the end, but I think we do need to understand what is being said here, and what is the dilemma of Israel today, and the paradox of what is going on in Israel today. First of all, what is he saying? The Lord is saying that the heir, who is the Son of God, who is the King of Israel, has finally come to his vineyard and he's been cast out. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Yes, there was a holy remnant and we will talk about that. A holy, most significant remnant who did receive him at that time. But the leaders, so to speak, didn't. The reality of the parable is that recognizing the heir to be Jesus, he was killed, and the leaders thought now they can take the inheritance for themselves, though casting him out of the vineyard. Now this is the sin. This is a very real thing. And what we can understand from this is that it is impossible to fully inherit the inheritance until the first heir is given his place as heir amongst his people. This is the key to understand everything that's connected to the destiny of Israel today. It's the key. Until the heir can inherit his inheritance, which is Israel, his inheritance cannot fully inherit her inheritance because it's all in and through him. This is a dilemma. You we can't get out of this. Now, some Christians will come to the conclusion, because Jesus says here, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to another nation, which will bear the fruit. This is like the foundation for replacement theology. But if we really look into scriptures, that's why we need to always take the fullness of scriptures and not just a part of scriptures, we will see that the first church was a Jewish church. It was New Testament Israel. It was Israel that had come into her godly inheritance in Messiah. And this is most important to understand. So, if we look at this, we can say then, this is a dilemma for modern Israel. Here we are back in our land. We see that God, step by step, is restoring the inheritance to his people. We have the land. He's even given us back Jerusalem in the Six-Day War. 
it was miraculous, a miraculous intervention of God. He's given the stewardship to Israel. God is fulfilling his promises, but there remains a dilemma. There remains a great dilemma that the Son of God is still been cast out of his vineyard, which means that we have to fight for the inheritance, which means that the inheritance is at stake, even though God's faithfulness will keep it. And we will talk about that as we go on. I just want to give you some basic understandings of scripture, and then we can move on to see where we're we going with all of this. The 70 years, we just spoke about the Jubilee, we spoke about the vineyard. The 70 years of Babylonian captivity ended with what? A return to the inheritance. Now, if we look in Jeremiah chapter 29, and this is what Jeremiah read and understood that the times were fulfilled when he read the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Now Daniel reads this. One man, doesn't say here that he had a whole group of people with him when he was doing this. He read this. And he understood by the books that the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord given through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now what happens? He doesn't say the times are fulfilled, let's begin to go back to the land. He humbles himself. He fasts. He prays. He realizes that something must be fulfilled in terms of a repentance that needs to take place in order for God to fulfill his promises of restoration to Israel. So we have this long prayer, which is a, a genuine and deep humbling of Daniel before the Lord, confessing, oh God, we have nothing to bring before you. No righteousness at all. We have transgressed. We have gotten exactly what you wrote about in the law of Moses. You have done what we deserve has come upon us. We appeal to your mercy. We appeal to your name, O oh God. We appeal to you and your purposes for Israel and your holy city, Jerusalem. And this man humbles himself before the Lord. And just as he's doing that, the Lord sends the angel Gabriel, who doesn't speak to him only about the 70 years, but speaks to him about 70 weeks of years, in which Jeremiah sees the whole future of Israel almost to the end. He doesn't only see the restoration of Jerusalem, he sees the coming of Messiah, he sees the destruction of Jerusalem another time through the Roman, doesn't say Roman, but it's speaking about the Romans. And ultimately, Daniel sees, not Jeremiah, Daniel, he sees the coming kingdom. But he humbles himself. Now, before the 70, 70th anniversary of Israel, about 13 years ago, the Lord put something very deep in my heart and in my brother's heart that we needed to call the leadership of the Messianic community in Israel after a time of, of a long fasting that was done before the Lord to repent before God for our sin as a nation 
against our king, against our Messiah. That this was a block between God and Israel, a real block. It's, it's God's controversy with Israel until this day. And we understood that we need to call the leadership in the land to a time of meetings of repentance, which we did in four different places, four different times, but we never did it in Jerusalem because I just had a sense it was not really the time of the Lord and it didn't seem as though the community had grasped, had grasped it to the degree that we could yet do that. Well, now before the 70th anniversary, it, it, it came to me and others that now is the time to do this in Jerusalem. And to make a long story short, we call the Messianic leadership in Israel together at Christ Church, where we worship the Lord. And we, we really humbled ourselves before God. There was a very, very powerful presence of God there that day. As Jewish leaders in the land, standing before God as priests for our nation, for our terrible rejection of Yeshua until this day. Yes, the Lord has veiled us. Yes, there's the other side of the story. But the sin has come upon us. We, ha we, have, we have suffered for generations, however you want to explain it. We were cast out of our land. The Lord did prophesy that these things would come upon us. And the restoration of the nation of Israel, as we see in Zechariah, the Lord will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication over the inhabitants of Jerusalem and Judah where we will weep and mourn over our sin against Yeshua HaMashiach. And of course this will go over the whole land and it will be each family. And there was a real sense that we as priests need to go before the nation and open up the way for the nation. And a lot of the Messianic community do, do, doesn't even think about this kind of thing. We often more think about the sins of the Gentiles towards Israel and what the Gentiles have to do than what we have to do. And of course we have many other sins in this nation besides that sin. But that is the key to the problem that the king of Israel is still cast out of his own vineyard and his own inheritance. So we knew that something very significant had taken place. And we did it as a congregation as well. I prepared our congregation for about five weeks. I wrote a whole liturgy of repentance that we did together before heaven for our sin against Yeshua. With the faith that this was going to bring a blessing of restoration to the people of Israel. So, as I said, Israel in its present situation is living in a divine paradox and dilemma. On one hand, we ex are experiencing the great mercy of God, and the word mercy is one of the key words in Zechariah, in Romans, when God speaks of his restoration of Israel, he always refers to his great mercy that's going to come back to the Jewish people. And of course, the Gentiles are a very important part of that expression of mercy that God is beginning to reveal through the church, through part of the church, to Israel today. So we are, yes, experiencing um, the first stages, very significant stages, the Aliyah, the restoration of the language, and of course the restoration of the Messianic community, which is key to everything that God is doing, of God's divine restoration. Now, in Israel, you have many Orthodox Jews. Jerusalem is two-thirds religious Jews. If we're talking about the Jewish population of Jerusalem, two-thirds of Jerusalem's population is religious. One-third is Haredi, extreme orthodox, one-third is orthodox, and one-third are secular Jews. Now, amongst the orthodox Jews, many are crying out to God. Many have uh, a sense of the messianic time that we're living in. Uh, and are very zealous for God. And not only 
in a fleshly zeal. I would say there is something very authentic that is beginning to happen among several of them, which is part of God's plan of restoration, even though the blinders are still there. And if you hear some of the, the worship that is coming out of uh, the younger generation of Orthodox Jews, some of it is very, 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 very deep and moving. But Israel as a nation, and you heard this, this man who spoke to you, this represents a very significant part of the Jewish nation today. Israel is essentially a secular nation with very worldly goals. We do not have, the goals of Israel today are not kingdom goals. And when you live in this country, especially as a Jew, who believes in the Messiah, but probably not only, you experience on one hand a deep sense of God's presence, his commitment, his covenantal uh, relationship to Israel, and on the other hand, a terrible absence and blindness. Uh, and and you, live, you live in a kind of tension all the time between these two. And it's only through faith, and that faith is God-given and it's real, that you overcome because you're living in the reality of God's word and what God has promised, which is the ultimate truth. And it's the ultimate reality of who Israel is, even though we don't fully see it. Yet, I have to say, I don't know if you can grasp all of this, but because Israel is the cultivated olive tree, even when the branches are broken off, there is something deep in the heart of many Jews in this God-given relationship between Israel and God. If you, if you read the Jewish liturgy, for example, it's much, much more passionate than the Christian liturgy. If you're talking about the Catholic liturgy, Anglican liturgy, whatever liturgy, the Jewish liturgy is much more passionate because it speaks of a relationship of the firstborn son to the father and a crying out to God from the depths very often uh, that you just sense that there's something there deep, deep down, even in the blindness, that when the veil will be removed, it's going to be something the world has never seen. Something the world has never seen when this nation finally is unveiled to her Messiah and finds her true vocation and identity in her king. So many of the Orthodox Jews are also involved in the whole world political system. Israel is a political state. And many Christians, when they come here, they're disappointed. So Israel as a nation is not God-centered. Israel as a nation is Israel-centered today. And when we celebrated our 70th anniversary, this was part of the pain of it all. The 69th anniversary was when we celebrated the Jubilee of Jerusalem. There was much more glory given to God at that celebration than on the 70th anniversary of Israel. Okay, so what, where are we going from here? God's plan for planet Earth cannot be fulfilled until Israel takes her place as firstborn son amongst the nations. The nations cannot come into their godly order and they cannot come into their divine vocation as nations. Now we're dealing with remnants. Remnants in Kenya, remnants in America, remnants here, remnants there. But when we talk about the nations, the nations will only find their right relationship to themselves and to the Lord as Israel takes her place amongst the nations. We can look in Deuteronomy 32. Verse 8. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations. Here we go again, the inheritance. We're talking about the inheritance. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, 
when he separated the sons of Adam. This is God's original plan. He set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. The boundaries of the people, peoples, have a direct relationship to the number of the children of Israel. Why? For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. This is so very important to understand. And of course, Jerusalem is at the heart of that place of his inheritance. So only as the Lord can take up his inheritance in Jacob, and he will not do that except that Jacob welcome him back to take his inheritance. And that's what Jesus said. You will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When that will take place, the nations will come into divine order. And they'll probably be very different than they are today. Africa will probably be divided up in a whole different way than the colonial nations have divided up Africa. Africa will probably be divided up according to God's original plan for the nations. That he alone knows and will not happen until God brings the perfect order when the kingdom comes, the final kingdom comes. When the final kingdom comes. Now God is looking today for a messianic people. God is looking today for a messianic people who yearn to see the manifestation on, of the kingdom of God now, but also in the future in its fullness. It, it's both. It's now, and it's also in its fullness when Jesus will return and the world will bend its knees before him, and Satan's rule and domination over the earth will come to an end. Now, the kingdom, and in Africa there's a, normally a much deeper understanding of the kingdom in terms of how to live the kingdom presently than there is in other nations of the world. This is something that the Lord has given to the Africans. And I think the whole vision that Africans have for Africa today is connected to how to how for the kingdom to begin to break forth in different areas of life through men and women of true integrity. Satan will attempt in these last days to take full domination over the earth. And we know he will try to set up his anti-Christian uh, kingdom and of course, Jerusalem will be connected to that in some way to prevent, in his ignorance, in his ignorance, Yeshua from establishing his kingdom over the earth. Satan will make every effort to keep the church from seeing her true and holy calling in these days and he will make every effort to destroy Israel by actually attempting to either bringing about another holocaust, and we hear echoes of that all the time coming from Iran, or by fully joining Israel into the world Babylonian system, which Israel would be very happy to join into. It's only God that keeps us from doing that ultimately. But as a nation, we would be most happy to do that, because there is a deep longing in the Jewish people to be connected to this world and to the nations, especially because of the spirit of rejection that's been over Israel so long. And the truth is that Israel has a lot to offer the world. And Israel is already offering the world many, many things in her very developed technology and intelligence. And of course, to make money and to do business. But the goal of Satan is that Yeshua will be deprived of inheriting 
that which is his. And it all goes back again to the heir and to the inheritance. And first of all, in the church. Because the church is that part of the earth today that is the kingdom of priests, so to speak, and knows the Lord by seducing the church through the spirit of deception and infiltrating her by the lies of Satan, both in her understanding of Israel and God's purposes with Israel, but also in terms just of the moral and doctrinal reality of the church. Now, we won't go into this in detail, but it's important to understand that a large part of the church today is going into apostasy. A large part of the church. Actually, you probably don't relate very much to the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church is 1.2 billion people. Amongst that 1.2 billion people, there are real saints and believers. In the Catholic Church today is the greatest spiritual battle they say since the fourth century, because of this pope that is leading the church, both morally and doctrinally, into darkness. And those in the church who recognize this and see this are speaking of apostasy, of schism, of something that's happening in that church that hasn't happened for centuries and centuries. Now, I mention the Catholic Church because it's the largest church in the world. But the Anglican Church, I mean, the faithful part of the Anglican Church is essentially the Anglican African and South American part of the church. And there's already been a split in the Episcopal Church because of apostasy. The Lutheran Church, full of apostasy today. There's a small remnant. And of that remnant, only few really have an understanding of Israel. And in the Methodist Church today, the Methodist Church today is moving into the direction of accepting homosexual marriages, where there was a great revival through the Wesley brothers. Now, we have to be aware of these things. We can't just kind of say, well, that's not the true church. And that's not, that's what, the evangelical church is being infiltrated with a liberal, m modernistic spirit. And the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is wanting to, to the church to wake up and to see what's going on and where are we going to. So there is a war within the church and surely to keep the church from seeing her responsibility to Israel. And there's a war against Israel in every way because Israel is foundational for the establishment of God's kingdom on the earth. God's kingdom cannot be established on this earth without Israel. It's impossible. Israel's the heart of the kingdom. That's the calling, a kingdom of priests. But where does that leave the bride? Where does that leave the bride? Now, most Christians don't really think about the coming kingdom. I don't think in Africa people speak that much about the coming kingdom because the church in Africa is much more concerned today about bringing present change into the church and present change into Africa, which is so necessary. And there's a godly vision in, the church, in a large part of the church in Africa. But what is the place of the bride in the kingdom? The bride in the kingdom is the one who will reign with Messiah for a thousand years on this earth. So everything that God is doing in the church, in the true church, the bridal church now, is in fact preparation for who we will be then. That's why it's so important to pass the tests now. That's why it's so important not to only have a vision for the now, but to have a vision for the future when the kingdom will come and the bride will reign with Jesus for a thousand years. And not all of, the, not all of Israel is Israel, and not all of the church is the bride. This is just a fact of the word of God. So the bride is the one who will reign with Messiah for a thousand years, but we have to allow him 
to take up his rule in us now. The kingdom begins from within. The kingdom does not begin from without. We can be very involved with the kingdom from without, and that is very important, very significant, but the kingdom must begin from within. Now, when Jesus took up the disciples to the Mount of Transfiguration, he said, some of you will not see death until you see the king kingdom of God coming with power. And then he takes them up to the mountain, and they see him transfigured with Moses and Elijah. Now, what, what, what does that have to do with the kingdom? Well, that has to do with the kingdom that in Messiah, the kingdom had fully come. He was totally possessed by the Father and the Holy Spirit, who had established their eternal kingdom fully in him. And Peter says that's a prophecy for the, for the church, because the transfiguration is what God wants to do in us. And as God can take possession of us from within through his word and his spirit, his kingdom can truly break through. Now, the Messianic community. The Messianic community in Israel is most significant. The Messianic community in Israel is most significant both for the reality of Israel, but also for the reality of the church. The first fruit is always a promise for the rest. And God always begins with a first fruit people. Now, the Messianic community is part of the church of Jesus. And there is a divine order. It's to the Jew first and to the Gentile. And in the identity of the body of Christ, there are different pictures that the word of God gives us. And this is all connected to the kingdom. One picture is Romans 11, the ingrafting of the wild branches into faithful Israel, not all of Israel, but faithful Israel. And of course, the, the natural branches being grafted back into their own tree. Again, a picture of the true unity. In other words, the true connection of the bride of Jesus amongst the nations is not first to the nation of Israel, but it's first to the holy remnant of Israel that already is the Israel of God and a promise for the whole nation. That is what Paul is saying to us in Ephesians 2, that you have been brought into the commonwealth of Israel. Now the commonwealth of Israel is the eternal Israel of God, the holy remnant of Israel. And it is essential in the plan of God that we find our place together for the fulfillment of God's purposes for Israel and the nations even before the return of the Lord. Now, God is wanting to take Israel and it's part of our intercession, and it's part of our offering unto God, from the wrong foundation that the nation is up on today to the only true foundation, who is Jesus. The foundation of the modern state of Israel, as I said, there are two main foundations. One is secular Zionism, which, of course, God has used to bring the Jews back to the land. Of course, God has been in this. He's been in it, but it's not the ultimate of God. And rabbinical Judaism. Now, if we look into Isaiah 28, and you'll see where I'm going in a few moments, how this all comes together. Isaiah 28. Verse 16, behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily, and I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet. 
The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies, and the waters will overflow the hiding place, and your covenant with death will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. Now, everything that is a covenant that is not with Messiah and rejects him is ultimately a covenant of death. And the Lord is warning through the remnant of Israel and the remnant in the church to bring Israel off the wrong foundation and back to her true godly foundation. And that stone, of course, is Messiah King, the same stone that we see in the book of Daniel that will fill the whole earth. And it is most important that the Messianic community, which is still very young, is supported and undergirded by the universal bridal remnant that can stand before the unseen spiritual world in this land. Now, the remnant in Israel today are the sons. Now, listen to me carefully. I'm going to, I'm, I want to make an important point now. If Israel can't fully inherit the inheritance, who can? The sons. Who are the sons? The Messianic believers. The Messianic believers, as we give Yeshua his place in Israel today, we as heirs, as sons, can stand before heaven on behalf of the whole nation and inherit the inheritance on behalf of the nation in a way that the nation can still not do. This is very significant. Together with the remnant from the church that stands the ground in the spirit and in faith for Israel to be restored to her true foundation, to her true calling, and to her true identity in Messiah. So the Messianic community in Israel is already an expression and will become more and more of the kingdom of priests as the first fruit holding the land for Jesus and Israel on the basis of God's covenant promises that are to be fulfilled in Yeshua. Because all of the promises of God are yea and amen in Messiah. Not outside of him, but in him. So we have to have a vision that's entirely Christocentric. Because the plan of God is to move Israel into a new covenant inheritance. And only as Messiah can take up his inheritance in Israel. So in our priesthood, we are holding the ground. That's what we're doing at Christ Church for years. We're holding the ground of the old city of Jerusalem for Israel and God's purposes before heaven. And we're standing before the Lord for the salvation of the remnant of Israel that he promised in his word. We're standing before the Lord for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that all the prophet, nearly all the prophets spoke about in the Old Testament that God would do in these last days. It wasn't one or two prophets. It was several prophets who had the vision of Jerusalem's restoration in the last days and the return of the glory. Zion. And this is something deep, deep, deep in the heart of God, the return of the glory to Zion. Now we have to remember, if we look at Romans chapter 9, this is the New Testament, when Paul speaks about the inheritance of Israel, what are the first two things that he speaks about? The adoption and the glory. The adoption and the glory. The adoption is the sonship. Israel is the firstborn son, but only in Messiah can we come into the full sonship. That's what Romans and Galatians are all about, if we've read it. And the glory, 
the glory is the, is, 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 the, is the full manifestation of the nature of God and it's part of the inheritance of Israel. And as the glory returns to Jerusalem, it will flow out from Jerusalem to all the earth. And again, as the kingdom in the New Testament, the glory is something that begins within, as we see in the transfer, transfiguration. The transfiguration is the outshining of the inner glory. And as the church is, it, it allows the kingdom to really possess her, the glory will be manifested. And so the Lord wants that <clears throat> to come back to Jerusalem, and that, we can't get into that now, but that's all connected to the fulfillment of the feast cycle and the Feast of Tabernacles in the end times, where God will <clears throat> still fulfill the last part of the feast cycle in Israel and for the church connected to Messiah. Okay, now we're going to look in the book of Zechariah, slowly moving towards the end, and you'll see how this whole thing moves together. Zechariah chapter 6. Now let's just talk a little about the book of Zechariah. The word Zechariah in Hebrew means the Lord has remembered. The Lord has remembered Jerusalem. Again, it was after the 70 years, Babylonian captivity. The Lord is telling Zechariah that he's coming back to Jerusalem with mercy. The book of Zechariah speaks about the restoration in, in, in the time of Zechariah and Haggai and Ezra and Nehemiah. But the book of Zechariah goes not only into the last days when Jerusalem, the Spirit will be poured out upon Jerusalem, it actually goes into the return of the Lord and the coming kingdom. So the book of Zechariah has a whole wide span that it relates to. But in the beginning of the book of Zechariah, we're dealing with the restoration. And we know that there were two main restorational prophets, Haggai, and Zechariah. We know that the book of Ezra and Nehemiah are connected to this whole story of restoration. We remember that in the book of Zechariah, the two people that represented the priesthood and the kingdom were Zerubbabel, the governor of Jerusalem, and Joshua, the high priest. Now, we don't want to go into all of that now, but it's important to make some very basic statements. In Zechariah chapter 6, Zechariah chapter 4 speaks about the restoration of the ministry of the priesthood and of the kingdom, Zerubbabel and Joshua. And it talks about the two olive trees and the glory returning to Jerusalem. And then when we come to Zechariah chapter 6, there is an amazing prophecy that comes. And we want to try to understand a little of this prophecy. In verse 9, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Receive the gift from the captives, from Heldai, Tobiah, and Judiah, who have come from Babylon, and go the same day and enter the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take the silver and gold and make an elaborate crown and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. Now, notice that crown is not put upon Zerubbabel, which is from the kingly line, but the crown is put upon Joshua, the high priest. And they make this crown, <clears throat> those who have come back. <clears throat> then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Now what temple does Jesus build? The branch is another name for Messiah. It's, of course, the temple in the New Covenant is the temple of living stones. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory, 
and shall sit and rule on his throne, and he shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Now what are we seeing here? We are seeing the final vision of Melchizedek. We are seeing the one who is both king and priest, sitting on his throne, carrying the glory, the one who builds his temple. Verse 14, now the elaborate crown shall be for a memorial in the temple of the Lord for Helam, Tobiah, Jediah, and Chen of the sons of Zephaniah. Even those who are far away shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Those who are far away were the Jews in Babylon, but it could well be also a reference to the Gentiles. Then you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now I want to give you just a very basic understanding of what's going on here. <clears throat> the nation has come back from Babylon from 70 years. Restoration is taking place. The city is being rebuilt. The temple is being rebuilt. The priesthood is being restored. You don't have a priesthood without a temple. The, the line of David, at least Zerubbabel, who's from that family, is governor in Jerusalem. So there's a restoration taking place by the Holy Spirit, just as there is now in the land of Israel. And then a second time, the prophet hears about Semach, the branch. And he sees a picture not connected to the present restoration, but he sees a picture connected to the final restoration in terms of Melchizedek, Yeshua, who is building the temple of God and who is both priest and king, and there's, there is peace between the two offices. And they are to take this crown that symbolically they put upon the high priest and then take that crown and put it into the temple of God as a memorial. Why? And what does that mean for us? That means that though a present restoration was taking place, God wanted them to see where it was all going to, connect them to it, and have an actual testimony of that crown in the temple as an evidence of that which is to be fulfilled in the end. Now this is very important for us today because it means that this was a prophetic and a priestly act and a testimony to the spiritual world of God bring, bringing his ultimate fulfillment. And this is something that addresses us as believers. We remember that in the first church in Jerusalem, the last question that they asked Jesus before he went up to heaven was, Lord, is this the time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Why? Because for the Jewish people, you don't have a Messiah, son of David, who is separated from the kingdom. It's the same thing. It's today, if you speak to Jewish people, they can also say, well, where, how can Jesus be the Messiah? We don't see the kingdom. And how can we see the kingdom of Israel is supposed to be at the heart of the kingdom? So Messiah and kingdom go together. So they ask Jesus, Lord, when you're going to pour out the Holy Spirit, because he said, stay in Jerusalem until I, I pour out, this, the Spirit will be poured out. Is it then that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Because they knew as Israelites that Jesus the Messiah had to bring the kingdom. Now, the kingdom comes in different stages. It begins in us. And Jesus spoke about the kingdom over and over again. His whole message was the kingdom message. 
When Jesus came on the donkey into Jerusalem, just before the cross, that might seem like a very insignificant act. But that fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9 9 was a prophetic priestly act before Jerusalem rejected him, proclaiming that he is the king of Israel. He is the rightful heir of the throne of David. That's why the proclamations. And as sure as he was coming into Jerusalem on that donkey, he was going to return on the white horse. And he was going to establish his kingdom in Jerusalem over the whole of Israel and the world. So that was the first part of the prophecy of Zechariah 9. The second part was about his kingdom going from sea to sea. So the early church, when they asked him, the early Jewish believers, Lord, will you, is this when you will establish the kingdom? He said, it's not for you to know the time and the seasons. <clears throat> but what happened when the Holy Spirit was poured out? That community was an incarnation of the reality of the kingdom. <clears throat> it was an incarnation. He spoke to them for 40 days about the kingdom of God after his resurrection. The Holy Spirit comes, he's enthroned in their hearts, and there's a manifestation of the kingdom. They share all things in common. They have a life that is literally an expression of the unity that we spoke of, of the Godhead. They, they were of one heart. They were of one mind. They shared everything. They broke bread from house to house. That's the Melchizedek table. That was at the center of the life, the Passover meal that they were sharing, the, the, the Lamb of God together. The kingdom was there, <clears throat> but in the spirit, it was also the statement that that final kingdom that they spoke about was coming. <clears throat> so they didn't only excuse me, they didn't only pray for the coming kingdom, they manifested the kingdom at the same time. Now this is the spiritual authority of the first church. We are to pray for the kingdom, we are to believe for the kingdom, but we are to manifest the kingdom. And it is the calling of the church in Jerusalem <clears throat> and we are not yet doing it as we should, and in all of Israel, that we're not just congregations, but that there is, before the nation of Israel, an expression of the kingdom of God. And that is part of our intercession of the kingdom that is to come, and it is already preparing the way and breaking the ground and manifesting in the spirit what will be in only a few years from now when the Lord Jesus will return and establish his kingdom on this earth. <coughs> and so the, 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 the uh, crown is the sign of the coming kingdom that they placed in the temple. And we are that temple. And it is most important that we grasp the reality that the church is now called to be, be a kingdom of priests. That's what Peter says in his first epistle. Oh, a lot of churches think, well, that means we're, we're now in the place of Israel. But the calling of the church is to be a kingdom of priests as a manifestation of what is and what is to come and to connect with Jerusalem today and the plan of God for the coming kingdom. And that house that Zechariah saw that the Lord is building, he is already building that house now in Jerusalem and in Israel. This is very important that we realize that today in Jerusalem, perhaps it's an infant stage, perhaps we can say like in the book of Haggai, you know, what is this in comparison to what was in the first chapters of the book of Acts? But again, it's like the embryo. It's always very significant to see what God is doing and what it is a sign of. It is a sign 
that the bride of Christ world over must find together in relation to Jerusalem, because Jerusalem has always been the city of unity and of peace. It's the place of the altar. If you're building altars over the land, there's only one altar of reconciliation, and that's Jerusalem. That's where the wall of partition, thank you very much. I'm almost finished. <clears throat> where the wall of partition was broken. Now, how, does that, how do we manifest that? Well, we manifest that part of what we're doing today is to get the vision. And as we get the vision, we obey the vision. We live the vision. And we understand what Paul says in the book of Ephesians, that the unity, the true unity that Jesus prayed for in John 17, when that is finally manifested between Jew and Gentile, and the church can't be one without the Jewish remnant. It just doesn't work. It can't work because it's not according to the order of God. There's a divine order. If we get the vision, then we understand what is the sign. Well, the sign is the Melchizedek table. The sign is, and it's more than a sign, it's the bread and the wine. Because when the body of Messiah partakes together in the true faith of what that covenantal meal is, Jew and Gentile, in Jerusalem, it is making known the manifold purposes of God to the principalities and powers in the high places. It's making known to the principalities and powers that it is finished. Amen. It is finished. And we have to understand what's happening in Jerusalem today, that the nations are coming up to Jerusalem. More and more we see the nations coming up. What is it? It's a picture of the millennium. It's a picture of what's to be. It's a prophetic statement of what is to be. But at the heart, is the unity of the bride. Because that unity of the bride will also manifest the glory, and the glory will spread over Israel and bring redemption and bring the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon this nation. And it will be an incarnate reality of what Jesus has fulfilled. It's not only a teaching, but the word becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us. This is the mystery of the bride. The mystery of the bride is, is not just the mystical church of Jesus somewhere out up in, the, in, in outer space. The mystery of the bride is there is an incarnation. And the Lord's Supper, he says, my flesh and my blood. The, the Lord's Supper is what brings us into that one body and flesh of Christ together and sharing of the life. And it's an intercession for the coming kingdom as we stand in that priesthood before God and we share in that covenant meal and in that covenant life. And we submit ourselves to the divine order in the church because that will be the divine order for the nations when the Lord comes. And that's why we will be able to rule and reign with him because we have already lived that reality now. Now, Christ has to first take up his inheritance in us. It's not first in Israel as she is today, but that is the Israel of God today. The Israel of God today are the Jews and Gentile who are one in Christ as an intercession a priestly intercession for the salvation of all of Israel and ultimately for the blessing of all the nations. So the 70 years and the Jubilee has all to do with the Lord taking his inheritance amongst his people. And as we are faithful to him for that, we can stand in that position of priesthood. And in the priesthood, we have the kingdom authority. We don't just have kingdom authority without the priesthood. It, Jesus had to lay down his life and give his life 
for the world. And then he entered into his glory and he stands at, sits at the right hand of the Father and he upholds all things through the word of his power. But he paid a price for that. He paid a price for that. So the kingdom is connected to the priesthood. And that's why they put the crown on Joshua the high priest, I believe, in any case. And so what I'm saying is for Israel to ultimately come into her calling of being a kingdom of priests, now we have to be that kingdom of priests in intercession for Israel and the nations and for the purposes of God to be fulfilled in these last times. And what a privilege it is for the Gentile part of the church to be able to bring that offering to God on behalf of Israel. It's such, a, it's such a holy privilege that God is giving the Gentile part of the church because Israel's God's firstborn son. I mean, you know, it's, it's like the story of Joseph and his brothers. It, it can't be complete until Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. He can't, he, he'll never be satisfied until his, his own brothers and sisters in the flesh fulfill their calling. And you have the privilege to be part of that, even if you're far away. You're here in Jerusalem today because God is connecting you in the spirit to this holy calling that he is bringing forth. That he, first of all, can possess his inheritance, and that we can then possess our inheritance in him and hold the ground and the spirit for Israel no matter what will come over this nation, whether it's Iran, whether it's Gaza, whether it's the Antichrist, there is a position that God will give us in the spirit before the principalities and powers, which is already a statement, the kingdom is coming. The kingdom is coming. He will sit as the, as, as, as the angel Gabriel said to Mary, he will sit on the throne of, of David and rule over the house of Jacob forever. He has not yet sit upon the throne of David. He has not yet sit upon the throne of David. And we are preparing that place for him. We are preparing the way for Israel. It's the calling of John the Baptist to prepare the way in the wilderness, Jew and Gentile, the Gentiles can have a calling to Israel that the Jewish believers can never fulfill. What our brother here is doing in Galilee, we can never do that. We never receive that kind of favor with the Israeli government, not at this stage, because they don't relate to us that way. But there is something that we have for Israel that the Gentiles can't do. They can't do it. We are, we are the testimony in flesh and blood to Israel that our true faith is the new covenant. Our true king is Jesus. This is the reality. It's not religion, it's him. And we're living that reality. And, 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 and we are that firstborn son and calling Israel into her true place and inheritance in God. So the Jubilee and the 70th year is all about the inheritance and the fulfillment of the calling in Exodus of the kingdom of priests that goes back to Melchizedek and that will be fulfilled when the Lord returns. But what we are doing now is, is breaking the ground and bringing Israel in the spirit back to the true foundation that the plan and the purposes of God will be fulfilled, first for the bride and then for Israel and the nations. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your wonderful plan of glory, because it's a plan of glory. And we thank you that each one of us can have a part in this plan. It's so big, and we're so small, but we serve such a great God. And we just want to thank you that the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We thank you that you began as a man in the womb of Mary, so tiny, so small. We can't understand how you reduced yourself 
to that, Lord. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to our understanding whatsoever. And Lord, we want to enter with you into that kenosis, Lord. We want to humble ourselves. We want to be emptied of self. That your life can take hold of us, that you can take possession of us, that we can really be fully your inheritance, and that you would be our inheritance, because the priest's great inheritance was the Lord himself and his sacrifices. And so we bow down before you this day. And Lord, I pray that whatever was of you in this word would be brought by revelation to these brothers and sisters, O oh God, and that they would see their place and their part and their nations as they are standing as priests, not only for Israel, but for their nations and for the continent of Africa, that in these last days has such an important place in your plan of restoration. So we give thanks and praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen.